Book Four, Canto Two of the Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Canto Two. Blandamour wins false Florimel. Paradel for her strives. They are accorded. Agape doth lengthen her son's lives. Firebrand of hell, first tined in Phlegaton by thousand furies, and from thence outthrown into this world to work confusion and set it all on fire by force unknown, is wicked discord, whose small sparks once blown, none but a god or godlike man can slake, such as was Orpheus, that when strife was growing amongst those famous imps of Greece, did take his silver harp in hand, and shortly friends them make. For such as that celestial psalmist was, that when the wicked fiend his lord tormented, with heavenly notes that did all other pass, the outrage of his furious fit relented. Such music is wise words, with time consented, to moderate stiff minds disposed to strive, such as that prudent Roman well invented, what time his people into parts did drive, them reconciled again, and to their homes did drive. Such used wise Glauce to that wrathful knight to calm the tempest of his troubled thought, yet Blandamour with terms of foul despite, and Paradel her scorned and set at naught, as old and crooked, and not good for aught. Both they unwise, and wareless of the evil that they by themselves under themselves is wrought, through that false witch and that foul aged drevel, the one a fiend, the other an incarnate devil, with whom, as thus they rode accompanied, they were encountered of a lusty knight, that had a goodly lady by his side, by whom he made great dalliance and delight. It was, to wit, the bold Sir Ferrar hight, he that from Bragadocio whilom reft the snowy Florimel, whose beauty bright made him seem happy for so glorious theft. Yet was it in due trial but a wandering weft, which when as Blandamour, whose fancy light was always flitting, as the wavering wind after each beauty that appeared in sight, beheld, Eft soons it pricked his wanton mind with sting of lust, that reason's eye did blind, that to Sir Paradel these words he sent. Sir Knight, why ride ye dumpish thus behind, since so good fortune doth to you present so fair a spoil, to make you joyous merriment? But Paradel, that had too late a trial of the bad issue of his counsel vain, list not to hark, but made this fair denial. Last turn was mine, well proved to my pain. This now be yours, God send you better gain. Whose scoffed words he, taking half in scorn, fiercely forth pricked his steed, as in disdain, against that knight, ere he him well could turn, by means whereof he hath him lightly overborne, who with the sudden stroke astonished sore upon the ground a while in slumber lay, the whiles his love away the other bore, and showing her did Paradel upbray. Lo, sluggish knight, the victor's happy prey, so fortune friends the bold, whom Paradel, seeing so fair indeed, as he did say, his heart with secret envy gan to swell, and inly grudge at him, that he had sped so well. Natheless, proud man himself the other deemed, having so peerless paragon I got, for sure the fairest Florimel him seemed to him was fallen for his happy lot, whose like alive on earth he weened not. Therefore he heard it court, did serve, did woo, with humblest suit that he imagined not, and all things did devise, and all things do, that might her love prepare, and liking win thereto. She, in regard thereof, him recompensed with golden words, and goodly countenance, and such fond favours sparingly dispensed, sometimes him blessing with a light eye-glance, and coy looks tempering with loose dalliance, sometimes estranging him in sterner wise, that, having cast him in a foolish trance, he seemed brought to bed in paradise, and proved himself most fool, 
in what he seemed most wise. So great a mistress of her art she was, and perfectly practised in woman's craft, that, though therein himself he thought to pass, and by his false allurements wily draught had thousand women of their love bereft, yet now he was surprised, for that false sprite which that same witch had in this form and graft was so expert in every subtle slight that it could overreach the wisest earthly wight. Yet he to her did daily service more, and daily more deceived was thereby. Yet Paradel him envied therefore as seeming placed in sole felicity. So blind is lust, false colors to describe. But Ate, soon discovering his desire, and finding now fit opportunity to stir up strife twixt love and spite and ire, did privily put coals unto his secret fire. By sundry means thereto she pricked him forth, now with remembrance of those spiteful speeches, now with the opinion of his own more worth, now with recounting of like former breaches made in their friendship as that hag him teaches. And ever when his passion is allayed, she it revives, and new occasion reaches, that on a time, as they together weighed, he made him open challenge, and thus boldly said, Too boastful, Blandamour, too long I bear the open wrongs thou dost me day by day. Well knowst thou, when we friendship first did swear, the covenant was, that every spoil or prey should equally be shared betwixt us tway. Where is my part then of this lady bright, whom to thyself thou takest quite away? Render therefore therein to me my right, or answer for thy wrong, as shall fall out in fight. Exceeding wrath thereat was Blandamour, and gan this bitter answer to him make, too foolish paradel, that fairest flower wouldst gather fain, and yet no pains wouldst take. But not so easy will I her forsake. This hand her won, this hand shall her defend. With that they gan their shivering spears to shake, and deadly points at either's breast to bend, forgetful each to have been ever other's friend. Their fiery steeds, with so untamed force, did bear them both to fell avenger's end that both their spears with pitiless remorse through shield and mail and habergeon did wend and in their flesh a grisly passage rend that with the fury of their own affret each other horse and man to ground did send where lying still a while both did forget the perilous presence stound in which their lives were set as when two warlike brigandines at sea, with murderous weapons armed to cruel fight, do meet together on the watery lee, they stem each other with so fell despite, that with the shock of their own heedless might their wooden ribs are shaken nigh asunder. They which from shore behold the dreadful sight of flashing fire, and hear the ordnance thunder, do greatly stand amazed at such unwanted wonder. At length they both upstarted in amaze, as men awaked rashly out of dream, and round about themselves a while did gaze, till, seeing her that Florimel did seem, in doubt to whom she victory should deem, therewith their dulled sprites they edged anew, and drawing both their swords with rage extreme, like two mad mastiffs, each on other flew, and shields did share, and males did rash, and helms did hew so furiously each other did assail as if their souls they would at once have rent out of their breasts that streams of blood did rail adown as if their springs of life were spent that all the ground with purple blood was sprent and all their armour stained with bloody gore yet scarcely once to breathe they would relent so mortal was their malice and so sore become of feigned friendship which they vowed afore. And that which is for ladies most befitting, to stint all strife, and foster friendly peace, was from those dames, so far and so unfitting, as that, instead of praying them surcease, they did much more their cruelty increase, 
bidding them fight for honor of their love, and rather die than ladies' cause release. With which vain terms so much they did their move that both resolved the last extremities to prove. There they, I ween, would fight until this day, had not a squire, even he the squire of dames, by great adventure travelled that way, who, seeing both bent to so bloody games, and both of old well knowing by their names, drew nigh to weet the cause of their debate, and first laid on those ladies thousand blames that did not seek to peace their deadly hate, but gazed on their harms, not pitying their estate. And then those knights he humbly did beseech to stay their hands, while he a while had spoken, who looked a little up at that his speech, yet would not let their battle so be broken, both greedy fierce on other to be broken. Yet he to them so earnestly did call, and them conjured by some well-known token, that they at last their wrathful hands let fall, content to hear him speak, and glad to rest withal. First he desired their cause of strife to see. They said it was for love of Florimel. Ah, gentle knights, quoth he, how may that be, and she so far astray as none can tell? Fond squire, full angry then, said Peridel, seest not the lady there before thy face? He looked back, and her advising well weaned, as he said, by that her outward grace, that fairest Florimel was present there in place. Glad man was he to see that joyous sight, for none alive but joyed in Florimel, and lowly to her louting thus behight, Fairest of fair, that fairness dost excel, this happy day I have to greet you well, in which you safe I see, whom thousand late misdoubted lost, through mischief that befell. Long may you live in health and happy state. She little answered him, but lightly did a great. Then, turning to those knights, he gan anew, and you, Sir Blandemour and Paradel, that for this lady present in your view have raised this cruel war and outrage fell, certes meseems be not advised well, but rather ought in friendship for her sake to join your force, their forces to repel that seek perforce her from you both to take, and of your gotten spoil their own triumph to make. Thereat Sir Blandemour, with countenance stern, all full of wrath, thus fiercely him bespake. A reed, thou squire, that I the man may learn, that dare for me think Florimel to take. Not one, quoth he, but many do partake herein, as thus. It lately so befell, that Saturan a girdle did uptake, well known to appertain to Florimel, which for her sake he wore, as him beseemed well. But when as she herself was lost and gone, full many knights that loved her like dear, thereat did greatly grudge that he alone that lost fair lady's ornament should wear, and gan therefore close spite to him to bear, which he to shun and stop vile envy sting, hath lately caused to be proclaimed each where a solemn feast with public tourneying, to which all knights with them their ladies are to bring. And of them all she that is fairest found Shall have that golden girdle for reward. And of those knights who is most stout on ground Shall to that fairest lady be preferred. Since therefore she herself is now your ward, To you that ornament of hers pertains Against all those that challenge it to guard, And save her honor with your ventrous pains. That shall you win more glory than ye here find gains. When they the reason of his words had hard, they gan abate the rancor of their rage, and with their honors and their love's regard the furious flames of malice to assuage. Though each to other did his faith engage like faithful friends thenceforth to join in one with all their force and battle strong to wage against all those knights as their professed foam that challenged aught in Florimel, save they alone. So well accorded, forth they rode together in friendly sort, that lasted but a while, and 
of all old dislikes they made fair weather. Yet all was forged and spread with golden foil, that under it hid hate and hollow guile. Necertes can that friendship long endure, however gay and goodly be the style that doth ill cause or evil end endure, for virtue is the band that bindeth hearts most sure. Thus, as they marched all in close disguise of feigned love, they chanced to overtake two knights that linked rode in lovely wise, as if they secret counsels did partake, and each not far behind him had his make, to weep two ladies of most goodly hue, that twixt themselves did gentle purpose make, unmindful both of that discordful crew, the which with speedy pace did after them pursue, who, as they now approached nigh at hand, deeming them doughty, as they did appear, they sent that squire of four to understand what mote they be, who, viewing them more near, returned ready news, that those same were two of the proudest knights in Fairyland, and those two ladies their two lovers dear, courageous Campbell and stout Triamond, with Canacy and Camping linked in lovely bond. While Ome, as antique stories tell in us, those two were foes, the felonest on ground, and battle made the dreadest dangerous that ever shrilling trumpet did resound though now their acts be nowhere to be found, as that renowned poet then compiled with warlike numbers and heroic sound, Dan Chaucer, well of English, undefiled, on fame's eternal bead-roll worthy to be filed. But wicked time, that all good thoughts doth waste, and works of noblest wits to naught outwear, that famous monument hath quite defaced, and robbed the world of treasure endless dear the which mote have enriched all us here. O cursed eld, the canker-worm of writs, how may these rhymes, so rude as doth appear, hope to endure, sith works of heavenly wits are quite devoured, and brought to naught by little bits? Then pardon, O most sacred happy spirit, that I, thy labours lost, may thus revive, and steal from thee the meed of thy due merit, that none durst ever whilst thou wast alive, and being dead, in vain yet many strive. Ne dare I like, but through infusion sweet of thine own spirit, which doth in me survive, I follow here the footing of thy feet, that with thy meaning so I may the rather meet. Cambello's sister was fair Canacy, that was the learnedst lady in her days, well seen in every science that mote be, and every secret work of nature's ways, in witty riddles, and in wise soothsays, in power of herbs, and tunes of beasts and birds, and that augmented all her other praise, she modest was in all her deeds and words, and wondrous chaste of life, yet loved of knights and lords. Full many lords and many knights her loved, yet she to none of them her liking lent, ne ever was with fond affection moved, but ruled her thoughts with goodly government, for dread of blame and honour's blemishment. And eke unto her looks a law she made, that none of them once out of order went, but like to weary sentinels well stayed, still watched on every side, of secret foes afraid. So much the more as she refused to love, so much the more she loved was and sought, that oftentimes unquiet strife did move amongst her lovers, and great quarrels wrought, that oft for her in bloody arms they fought, which when as Campbell, that was stout and wise, perceived would breed great mischief, he bethought how to prevent the peril that mote rise, and turn both him and her to honour in this wise. One day, when all that troop of warlike wooers assembled were, to weet whose she should be, all mighty men and dreadful daring doers, the harder it to make them well agree, amongst them all this end he did decree, that of them all which love to her did make, they by consent should choose the stoutest three, 
that with himself should combat for her sake, and of them all the victor should his sister take. Bold was the challenge, as himself was bold, and courage full of haughty hardiment, approved oft in perils manifold, which he achieved to his great ornament. But yet his sister's skill unto him lent most confidence and hope of happy speed, conceived by a ring which she him sent that Mongst the many virtues which we read had power to staunch all wounds that mortally did bleed. Well was that ring's great virtue known to all, that dread thereof and his redoubted might did all that youthly rout so much appall that none of them durst undertake the fight. More wise they weened to make of love delight than life to hazard for fair lady's look. And yet uncertain by such outward sight though for her sake they all that peril took whether she would them love or in her liking brook amongst those knights there were three brethren bold three bolder brethren never were born born of one mother in one happy mould born at one burden in one happy morn thrice happy mother and thrice happy morn that bore three such three such not to be fond. Her name was Agape, whose children were all three as one. The first height Priamond, the second Diamond, the youngest Triamond. Stout Priamond, but not so strong to strike. Strong Diamond, but not so stout a knight. But Triamond was stout and strong alike. On horseback used Triamond to fight, and Priamond on foot had more delight but horse and foot knew diamond to wield. With curtax used diamond to smite, and triamond to handle spear and shield, but spear and curtax both used priamond in field. These three did love each other dearly well, and with so firm affection were allied, as if but one soul in them all did dwell, which did her power into three parts divide like three fair branches budding far and wide that from one root derive their vital sap and like that root that doth her life divide their mother was and had full blessed hap these three so noble babes to bring forth at one clap their mother was a fay and had the skill of secret things and all the powers of nature which she by art could use unto her will and to her service bind each living creature through secret understanding of their feature. There, too, she was right fair, when so her face she list discover, and of goodly stature. But she, as fays are wont, in privy place did spend her days, and loved in forests wild to space. There on a day a noble youthly knight, seeking adventures in the savage wood, did by great fortune get of her the sight, as she sate careless by a crystal flood, combing her golden locks, as seemed her good, and, unawares, upon her laying hold, that strove in vain him long to have withstood, oppressed her, and there, as it is told, got these three lovely babes that proved three champions bold, which she with her long fostered in that wood, till that to ripeness of man's state they grew. Then, showing forth signs of their father's blood, they loved arms, and knighthood did ensue, seeking adventures where they any knew. Which, when their mother saw, she gan to doubt their safety, lest, by searching dangers new, and rash provoking perils all about, their days mote be abridged through their courage stout, Therefore desirous then of all their days to know, and them to enlarge with long extent, by wondrous skill and many hidden ways, to the three fatal sisters' house she went. Far underground from tract of living went, down in the bottom of the deep abyss, where Demogorgon in dull darkness pent far from the view of gods and heaven's bliss, the hideous chaos keeps their dreadful dwelling is. There she them found, all sitting round about the direful distaff, standing in the mid, and with unwearied fingers, drawing out the lines of life from living knowledge hid. Sad Clotho held the rock, 
the whiles the thrid by grisly lachesis was spun with pain that cruel atropos eftsoons undid with cursed knife cutting the twist in twain most wretched men whose days depend on thrid so vain she them saluting thereby them sate still beholding how the threads of life they span and when at last she had beheld her fill trembling in heart and looking pale and wan her cause of coming she to tell began to whom fierce atropos bold fay that durst come see the secret of the life of man well worthy thou to be of jove accursed and eke thy children's thrids to be asunder burst whereat she sore afraid yet her besought to grant her boon and rigour to abate that she might see her children's thrids forth brought and know the measure of their utmost date to them ordained by eternal fate which clotho granting showed her the same that when she saw it did her much amate to see their threads so thin as spider's frame and eke so short that seemed their ends out shortly came she then began them humbly to entreat to draw them longer out and better twine that so their lives might be prolonged late but lachesis thereat gan to repine and said fond dame that deemst of things divine as of humane that they may altered be and changed at pleasure for those imps of thine not so for what the fates do once decree not all the gods can change nor jove himself can free then since quoth she the term of each man's life for naught may lessened nor enlarged be grant this that when ye shred with fatal knife his line which is the eldest of the three which is of them the shortest as i see eftsoons his life may pass into the next and when the next shall likewise ended be that both their lives may likewise be annexed unto the third that his may so be trebly wexed they granted it and then that careful fay departed thence with full contented mind and coming home in warlike fresh array them found all three according to their kind but unto them what destiny was assigned or how their lives were eked she did not tell but evermore when she fit time could find she warned them to tend their safeties well and love each other dear whatever them befell so did they surely during all their days and never discord did amongst them fall which much augmented all their other praise and now to increase affection natural in love of canacy they join it all upon which ground this same great battle grew great matter growing of beginning small the which for length i will not here pursue but rather will reserve it for a cant on you End of Book 4, Canto 2 Recording by Thomas Copeland